Today on Killer Bites, I'm going to tell you about Meredith Kircher's case. When a foreign exchange student living in Italy found out her roommate had been slain, she didn't seem that phased. At the crime scene, she and her boyfriend were smiling and laughing like it was no big deal. Then when she was brought to the police station, she did yoga and practiced the splits in the waiting room. During her interview with the investigators, this chick tried to frame her boss for the crime who had an airtight alibi. So was she the one who executed her roommate? Seems like it, right? Well, the courts still can't make up their minds, but let's see if we can. On the morning of November 2nd, 2007, a 20-year-old American exchange student named Amanda Knox walked back to her flat in Perugia, Italy after spending the night with her boyfriend. When Amanda approached her front door, she noticed it was open and the windows were broken. Any average person would probably stop in their tracks and call their roommate or the police. But Amanda? That girl just walked straight through the front door and headed for the bathroom. In the sink, Amanda noticed a few drops of red fluid, but again, didn't think much of it and went about her routine. Unfazed, little Miss Amanda took a shower, but when she got out, she saw there was a red footprint on the bathroom rug. But in true Amanda fashion, she brushed it off and started to blow dry her hair. Well, Amanda finally freaked out and thought to seek help, but do you want to know what finally caused her to do so? She saw that someone had taken a shit in the toilet and didn't flush. Yeah, that's disgusting, but how did Amanda find that the most concerning element out of everything going on at the apartment? Anyway, after the toilet discovery, Amanda went back to her boyfriend Raffaele's house. She filled Raffaele in on the sitch and said she was worried that someone else may have been in her apartment. So he agreed to go back over there with her to check things out. As the couple walked through the apartment, they noticed that Amanda's roommate's door was locked. That roommate's name was Meredith Kircher. She was a 21-year-old British exchange student studying and living in Italy. Meredith and Amanda also lived in the flat with two Italian lawyers, Philomena and Laura. Amanda called Meredith's phone but got no answer. Meredith always answered her phone, so this was extremely out of the ordinary. Amanda then called her other roommate, Philomena, to let her know what was going on, and as soon as she hung up, she called Meredith two more times. Still, no answer. Amanda started to panic. Why isn't she answering? What if something bad happened to her? What was behind her door? These were all the questions running through Amanda's head. Philomena called Amanda back and said she was on her way home to help figure out what was going on and where Meredith was. With Amanda getting more terrified by the second, Raffaele tried to kick down Meredith's door, but his attempts were unsuccessful. Right around that time, two cops pulled up. They hadn't been called by Amanda, Philomena, or Raffaele. They had actually been called by one of Amanda's neighbors who found two phones in the bushes. The phones belonged to Meredith. So these cops were from the postal police force and they were just there to return the phones. But once they arrived and found out about the potential break-in and Meredith's locked door, they decided to search the home. Around that time, Raffaele called the Carabinieri, Italy's military police force that dealt with more serious crimes. He didn't tell them the postal police were already there and said nothing was missing from the apartment. Officials were able to bust down the door to Meredith's room. There, they found her lifeless body on the ground underneath a tan duvet. Meredith was only wearing a shirt that had been pulled up to her shoulders. The rest of her clothes were scattered on the floor of her room, including her bra that had been cut off. This led the authorities to believe the perp forced himself on Meredith. The cops noted there were marks on Meredith's neck to suggest she was slashed with the blade repeatedly. These items of Meredith's were reported as missing. Two credit cards, 300 euros, and a set of house keys. But Meredith's laptop, purse, jewelry case and camera were still there in plain view. Forensic specialists thoroughly searched the scene, took photos and videos, and gathered evidence over the next four days. They immediately noticed a few things that didn't match up with a classic break-in. Glass shards from the broken windows were on top of Meredith's clothes. If a perp broke in to attack Meredith and take off her clothes, the glass should be under her clothing. And the big rock in her room seemed to be too heavy to be thrown from the ground floor. It was also too big to fit through the hole in the window. These elements, in combination with the expensive items left untouched, led officials to believe the break-in was staged. In the autopsy, medical examiners reported Meredith had 40 wounds in total. She had been throttled and slashed in the neck, which is what ultimately caused her to pass away. Examiners also confirmed the theory that Meredith was physically violated and a DNA sample from an unknown male was recovered from her body. But Meredith had too many wounds for them to all be caused by one person. She didn't have many defensive wounds and was trained in karate, which meant she may have been able to fight off one attacker. These findings led authorities to believe that this crime was a group effort. Standing outside during the search, Amanda and Raffaele were seen all over one another. Some witnesses reported the couple was even laughing at one point. So just extremely inappropriate behavior for what's going on. Also, a vigil was held for Meredith and guess who didn't show up? Amanda and Raffaele. They went out for dinner instead. For three obvious reasons, Amanda and Raffaele were brought in for questioning. 
First, because they were there at the crime scene. Second, because Amanda was Meredith's roommate. And third, because they seemed guilty as hell. So Amanda said that on the night before Meredith's discovery, she slept at Raffaele's place. She claimed they cooked dinner, watched a movie, smoked a bit, and had some fun in bed before falling asleep. In another room, Raffaele said he wasn't sure if Amanda was with him all night. In one of Amanda's interview sessions, detectives asked her about a text message from her boss, Patrick. So her boss texted her that evening saying not to come into work because they didn't need her. Instead of saying something like, sick, thanks, Amanda replied, see you later. Amanda claimed this was just a general like, I'll see you when I see you text, but later she cracked under pressure and said she took her boss over to her apartment because he had a crush on Meredith. Amanda's account of taking Patrick over to her place meant she lied about being at Raffaele's the whole time. So it was on to the suspect list for her. At the end of Amanda's multiple interrogations on November 1st, she signed a form that said she was at her apartment the night Meredith was slain and watched Patrick slash her roommate until she passed away. Later, Amanda said this was all a forced confession. She claimed she was bullied and beaten by the police. She didn't have a translator at the beginning of her interrogations and hadn't gotten a lawyer yet, so it's really hard to tell at this point. But even still, that form was signed, so investigators went forward with arresting Patrick, her boss. Police officers searched Patrick's home and brought him in for questioning. He denied any involvement and said he was bartending that night. Patrick believed Amanda tried to frame him for the crime because he was black. Yeah, this was an awful case in every aspect. On November 6th, a customer of the bar Patrick worked at confirmed he was there all night, securing his alibi and discrediting Amanda's claims. When asked why she threw Patrick under the bus for the crime, she said, I was stressed, I was scared, it was after long hours in the middle of the night. I was innocent and they were telling me I was guilty. At that point, the police found a few other inconsistencies and potential pieces of evidence, so they came out and publicly stated they had arrested Meredith's attackers, Amanda and Raffaele. But just when the police thought they had their perps arrested, a match for a fingerprint found at the crime scene came up. It wasn't Patrick's, Amanda's, or Raffaele's. The fingerprint belonged to a man named Rudy. But this match wasn't made until two weeks after Amanda and Raffaele were arrested. So Rudy was a 20-year-old immigrant from the Ivory Coast who had been living in Italy for 15 years. There was a dark red fingerprint on a pillowcase underneath Meredith's body that Rudy came up as an exact match to. This was a pretty easy connection to make as Rudy's prints were already in the system since he was an immigrant. Police officers searched Rudy's place and collected a DNA sample from his toothbrush to test against the other samples found at the scene. He was a match for the DNA evidence pulled from Meredith's body, sweatshirt, and bra strap. By the time Rudy's name came up, he had already fled the country but he was quickly tracked down and arrested in Germany. Rudy told the authorities that he knew Meredith and Amanda through their downstairs neighbors who were his friends. According to Rudy, he was at their apartment when the crime took place, but wasn't the one who whacked Meredith. He also said Amanda and Raffaele weren't there. In Rudy's interview, he stated that he and Meredith kissed and felt each other up that night, but didn't hook up because they didn't have protection. Sometime that evening, Rudy said his stomach was bothering him, so he went to the bathroom on the other side of the apartment because he had to... Well, take the Browns to the Super Bowl, if you know what I mean. While he was sitting on the toilet, Rudy said he heard Meredith scream. And when he got up to see what was going on, he saw a dark figure standing over Meredith with a blade in hand. The man then slashed Rudy's hands and ran away while saying this in Italian. Found black man, found culprit, let's go. The translation seems a little rough, but you get the point. Rudy said he tried to help Meredith, but she was too far gone. He never called the police though. That, in conjunction with the overwhelming amount of DNA evidence, led the jury to find Rudy guilty in his trial, which took place in October of 2008. With that, Rudy was sentenced to serve 30 years in prison, but the jury stated they believe Rudy did not act alone. The prosecution suggested Meredith's demise was a result of a sex game gone wrong and that Amanda and Raffaele were involved. In January of 2009, Amanda and Raffaele's trial began. There were several pieces of evidence presented to suggest the couple's involvement. For starters, there were multiple liquid samples pulled from the bathroom that contained the mixed DNA of Amanda and Meredith. The prosecution believed that that was proof Amanda was there that night because they had lost fluid at the same time. Another piece of evidence presented was a kitchen blade that was found in Raffaele's apartment. Prosecutors had reason to believe that that was the weapon used on Meredith because Meredith's DNA was found on the sharp portion of the blade where Amanda's was found on the handle. This piece of evidence caused a lot of drama though because the defense claimed there wasn't enough reliable DNA to create a genetic profile. Sketchy piece of evidence number three, the clasp from Meredith's bra. So when the authorities first searched the crime scene, the clasp was missing. But when they came back for another search 46 days later, officials found the clasp with Raffaele's DNA on it. A lot of people speculated why that wasn't found initially. Maybe it was a plant or something? The defense also claimed the evidence was contaminated because it hadn't been collected and tested in the beginning stages of the investigation. 
And last but not least, red smeared footprints in the bathroom that belonged to Amanda. The prosecution claimed this proved Amanda and Raffaele had gone back to the apartment that evening because Amanda's footprints were made in Meredith's DNA. On December 29, 2009, Amanda and Raffaele were found guilty. Amanda was sentenced to 26 years in jail, Raffaele, 25. This decision caused a huge uproar in the media. A lot of Americans expressed their support for Amanda and claimed she was discriminated against because she was a young and pretty American woman. Amanda and Raffaele's lawyers fought hard to get their clients' appeals due to the confusing evidence and possible false witness statements. In the appeal process, forensic analysts concluded the DNA evidence used in Amanda and Raffaele's trials were unreliable. Months later, one of Rudy's cellmates came forward with a claim that Rudy said Amanda and Raffaele were not involved in the crime. With the help of the Idaho Innocence Project, Amanda and Raffaele's convictions were overturned on October 3rd, 2011. But one of Amanda's charges was for her framing Patrick, so that one was upheld. Amanda ended up returning to the US and picking up with her studies at the University of Washington. But in March of 2013, she was sent back to Italy to stand trial with Raffaele again for the execution of Meredith because their acquittals had been overturned. In 2014, the prosecutors successfully argued that DNA evidence had been disregarded and Amanda and Raffaele's guilty charges were put back in place. But come 2015, Amanda and Raffaele's cases made it to Italy's top courts and their rulings were overturned again. At the time we're filming this, that's the latest decision, but honestly, it seems like Italian courts might go back and forth forever. While Amanda and Raffaele were set free, Rudy remained in jail until December of 2020 when he was granted permission from the court system to finish the rest of his sentence with community service. Whew, what a roller coaster this one was. And the worst part is we still don't really know what happened to Meredith after all of that court drama. Anyway, thanks for watching and please don't walk into your home when the door is wide open and the windows are smashed. Just call for help. See you next time.